Yes, that's recording in progress. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, 254 of you joining us now in this last of the series of 10 sessions on um, teaching better as Catholic teachers and um, being better teachers in the Catholic schools. If you're already in Facebook, you would have noticed I posted two um, articles, two reading materials today. They are uh, Pope uh, St. Pope John Paul II's letter to artists he wrote in 1999. And then the other one is a the final document prepared by the Pontifical Council for Culture entitled Via Pulcritu Dinis, the way of beauty. If there is a way of the cross, and then there is going to be later, I'm going to talk to you about the way of um, art, of uh, beautiful um, painting. Then there is this document that practically summarizes what I need to get across via, uh, via Pulcritu Denise. And you know, my dear fellow teachers, we just heard the presentation of uh, Sir Burns about the state of affairs regarding purity, modesty, and chastity in the world, or the absence of it, or the lack of it. There is so much um, glorification of the vulgar. If you agree, can you type in the chat box, agree? There seems to be a glorification of the vulgar that is happening in the world today in uh, music. Uh, you go to Spotify and most of the songs there, you're going to see explicit lyrics. You're going to hear about uh, songs that talk about sex, casual sex, free sex, or uh, senseless things, or what is vulgar. <laughs> um, and then the performance art, uh, which for me is many times not an art. You read, I'm sure, about that girl who stood in the middle of uh, the street in New York, uh, naked, and then with a signboard that says, you can do anything you want with me. And then she claims it's art. Uh, of course, people there later uh, threw trash at, at her, painted her body, uh, pinched her. And then at the end of the day, she called it performance art. I don't see any art there. <laughs> or the movies that you watch, there's a lot of violence, sex, heavy on sex. Sometimes um, even Disney movies trying to present um, a different kind of morals. Um, well, thankfully not lately, but uh, every so often you see movies that are supposed to be for kids, for children, and, that, and yet you see a certain vulgarity, of course, um, they say many cartoons now are very violent, violent in the sense of uh, what the characters do or violent because um, they don't just reflect what we want our young people to be more immersed in, which is uh, peace and harmony and beauty of life. For those of you who are not uh, Filipinos, the, the um, series in television, we call them teleseries or telenovelas. And sometimes you have characters there uh, who will um, <laughs> um, slap each other as part of the highlight of the show <laughs> or fashion. Um, I showed you uh, a few days ago some scre uh, screenshots of uh, the... Um, TikTok of uh, the number one Filipino TikToker with 80 million followers and um, fashion sometimes that uh, your mother will not allow you or will not be very happy to see you wearing. <laughs> so that's the kind of world that we're living in right now. There seems to be a glorification of the vulgar. Now more than ever, we have to present to them the opposite, the beauty of um, I mean, beauty as it is willed by God. And thankfully, um, that is what our ancestors, ancestors in the faith have done. They used art in order to educate um, Catholics, in order to educate simple people, in order to transmit the message, for example, of the gospel to those who did not know how to read 
or um, had little schooling or had little training because as early as um, age of 10, they have to be helping in the farm. They have to be helping in the field. So they could not be educated. They needed to be taught the faith through the beauty of art, sacred art. And that's what we are very fortunate in the Catholic Church. This is one of the richest treasures of the Catholic Church, how um, so many beautiful works of art that we have to be able to teach the faith to the young people. Let's make use of them. Let's, uh, not to mention, of course, um, the fact that we are dealing with the digital natives, the um, technocentric immersed um, kids <laughs> who are very visual, audiovisual. Um, they cannot just be reading. They you will have to watch and hear and listen and to get entertained. <laughs> so fortunately, our uh, ancestors in the faith saw art as precisely a tool for teaching. Most art was made for religious purposes. Paintings and sculptures were placed in churches in order to help teach people who could not read. And so we are so blessed in the Catholic faith that we have churches that once you see them, once you visit them, your jaw falls. You cannot help but kneel in awe and say, God is here. This is how great my God is. This is how beautiful my Catholic faith is. Um, all over the world in times past, that's like the measure of um, how we constructed churches. What is the measure? The measure of love. <laughs> is this um, chapel, is this church, worthy enough of really being able to offer to God? And can, can this design really say, Lord, God, we adore you, we worship you, we love you. <laughs> and so um, here in the Philippines, I tried getting uh, pictures, for example, of beautiful churches. And I discovered uh, the highlight of Catholic churches in the Philippines uh, the highlight is their historicity, the fact that they've been there for hundreds of years, the fact that they have withstood earthquakes. And uh, <laughs> But we have many beautiful churches, which if you visit, you can really say, God is here. This is the house of God. It's worthy uh, of keeping God himself present with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. St. Pope John Paul II said in that letter to artists, in order to communicate the message entrusted to her by Christ, the church needs art. Art must make perceptible and as far as possible attractive the world of the spirit of the invisible of God. And so when we teach our students the faith, um, let us make them realize, wow, we have all these beautiful churches that really express that great love, that great divinity of God being present there. This is one of the most spectacular Catholic churches we have in the world. This is in Barcelona, designed by Gaudí, which after 135 years, it's not done yet. It, he's not finished yet. <laughs> I mean, he's already dead, but they still have to put in place every detail that Gaudi uh, put in his plan. Last December, they added this star uh, representing Our Lady on one of the towers. Um, beautiful. Or this church of Las Lajas in Colombia. Beautiful. When you see it, you say, wow, that is the serving of God's presence, <laughs> even with his literal presence. Now, Las Lajas is especially important because Our Lady, um, the reason why they put up this beautiful church is because Our Lady performed miracle here, appearing on a rock. <laughs> this is a rock in one of the walls of uh, Las Lajas. Um, and that's the reason why they have to build a church there. You know, modern science and scientists of modern times tried to uh, <coughs> study the painting more closely. 
when you paint, you usually have layers, right? So they tried to determine how thick were the paint, the paints that were used, or how uh, deep or the um, the paint is, so that they can possibly remove it and possibly uh, put it in an altar. And they discovered that as they go deeper and deeper, the paint continues to be there, continues to be present. The whole rock itself is the painting. <laughs> Even if you dig very deep in the red part, the deep part contains the red color. The, so this is one of those images of Our Lady where she emphasizes the beauty of the rosary, the importance of praying the rosary. You have there to the left the image of St. Dominic to whom Mary revealed the Holy Rosary. And then to the right is St. Francis to whom also Our Lady reminded him later on to preach to people about praying the rosary. So you look at these places and your uh, heart melts. I mean, uh, you have to be stone-hearted not to be moved. Now, some people will say, isn't this extravagance? Isn't this too much? Well, to answer that question, you remember that anecdote of uh, rich people building a church. And they commenting, this is already too, ex uh, too much. And then the poor people looking at it and saying, is this good enough for God, for our God, for our Lord, who deserves all that we have? <laughs> so when we look at this, we look at the details, we conclude, wow, the people who constructed this knew the meaning of love for God, knew what it really means to give God the best that you have. Beautiful churches, one look, we cannot help but fall on our knees and tell our Lord, my Lord and my God, I can say you are here. <laughs> That's the beauty of art. And many times we have to show the young people, this has always been what the Catholics, what good Catholics did. They gave the best that they could to our Lord, as we should give the best of our life to our Lord. Let me tell you the story related to Sir Burns' topic earlier on. I don't know if you have heard of Leia Darrow. Leia Darrow was a finalist in America's Next Top Model, where they are made to wear uh, skimpy clothes, bikinis for pictorials, and women dying to be in that show, trying to be the next America's top model. And Leia Darrow was one of the contestants there, one of the finalists, in fact. And then one day in a pictorial, she lost consciousness. And then she had a vision, seeing herself offering her life to God. And then God looking at it and looking disappointed and Leia Darrow realizing this is it this is all I can offer to God my body that is being presented as an object of lust and desire and then she woke up she um, got um, back to consciousness and she realized what she was doing she put on her clothes and she barged out of that place they were telling her wait wait we're not done with the pictorials and she said you can have that i don't need your eighteen thousand uh, dollars payment i don't want to be next america's top model i want to remind the world of the beauty of chastity and modesty and the the beauty of the body as creation of god that has to be worthy of being offered to god and we look at our churches and the churches speak of that this is a kind of worthy offering that we should be making, reminding us of the story of Cain and Abel. Abel offered the best of his harvest of uh, the animals, and Cain offered the worst of his crops. God accepted the offering of Abel, and because of jealousy, Cain killed his brother. <laughs> so then, um, this all express the beauty that we see in the churches, in um, our architecture, 
in the paintings, they all speak of the love of God, that the artists, that the architects, that those who constructed them, who built them, have for God, for our faith, for our mother, the church. And how I wish you know, we can have the chance of being able to visit, even just here in the Philippines, um, how I wish somebody can make a listing, um, a comprehensive listing of the most beautiful churches you should visit in the Philippines before you die. Uh, you know, that, that kind of tourism guide. No? <laughs> um, San Sebastian Church, for example, the only Gothic church that we have here in the Philippines, San Beda, uh, with the beautiful um, altar, things like that. How I wish we are more... Um, I mean, more materials are created or made in order to get people to be aware that, wait, there are so many that are there that really, once you visit, you go inside the church, you cannot help but kneel and say, Lord, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> am I offering you enough? Am I offering you as good a life as all these artists, these architects uh, manage to do? And those people who built them and constructed them and painted them and designed them, how I wish we can have something more like that here in the Philippines in order to help um, Filipinos, no? our fellow Filipino and Catholics. Of course, uh, all over the world, you Google it, you will find so many websites that put together some of the best churches in the world. So then, the arts may offer a chance to reflect, to feel, to feel uplifted and be happy, and to bring something intellectually or spiritually nourishing into our lives. That's the power of the beauty of art. Um, more churches in, in um, the Duomo in Florence. All these give us a glimpse of the sublime. And that's why even just in pictures, <laughs> in slides, in PowerPoint presentations, we have to open the eyes of our students to all this beauty of the treasures of the church in arts, in architecture, in sculptures. In... That is how we can make them fall in love with a faith. It's one of those given by Sister Mary Loyola, the author of Visualized Church History. She includes that as one of the most powerful ways that you can make the students fall in love with a faith. Show them all these fantastic, beautiful treasures of art of the Catholic Church. A glimpse of the sublime, and Eugene says here, yes, a glimpse of heaven. That when you go there, and then especially if there's a beautiful choir that is singing an with angelic voices, you go to Santo Domingo and... Um, Hopefully, you catch the uh, tipless, the Santo Domingo, with their angelic voices singing hymns to our Lord, our Lady. And you can break in tear, break down in tears and say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for this beauty of music, of the altar, of the image of Our Lady, of your presence here. That's the beauty, the power of um, presenting to the young people art. It's very powerful. And I'm going to show you, um, in fact, a way of using art in order to get them or to lead them to pray, to contemplate. You know, according to Teresa of Avila, there are different uh, levels of prayer. Um, the highest level of prayer, you don't need words. It, it, it's not about... Uh, petition, Lord, give me this, give me that. Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Uh, the highest form of prayer is contemplation where you just look at a, a picture, a, a sculpture, or the tabernacle, or our Lord exposed in the Holy Eucharist, and no need for words. You are there. Lord, I love you. I am here, ready to listen. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening, <laughs> because that is what's supposed to be a prayer. That's what prayer is supposed to be all about. It's a dialogue. It's not just a one-way thing of going to him and then giving him a list of petitions, things I am worried about now, things I am um, problematic about. <laughs> it's also about going to the 
um, chapel or to the church or in front of the tabernacle and simply saying, Lord, I'm here. I want to hear what you have to say. Your servant is listening. And just looking at that picture, that beautiful painting, the reredo, the altar, the sculpture, we should be led to contemplation of the beauty of God, of the beauty of uh, the faith that he has given us. Of course, the mother of all churches, St. Peter's, St. Peter's um, Basilica, one of the four major basilicas in Rome, together with St. Paul outside the church, Santa Maria Maggiore, St. John Lateran. But this, St. Peter's Basilica is where usually, normally, um, the Pope celebrates Mass uh, and delivers the Urbi et Orbi message no? to the city and to the world. In all senses of the world, oh, the word art is powerful. It connects us with a true beauty of God himself. And, uh, well, the um, architect who designed this uh, St. Peter's Basilica, I mean, can you type in the chat box, uh, yes, if you have seen, if you have visited, if you have been to this beautiful um, treasure of the church, okay, <laughs> great, fantastic, uh, so many of you have been able to visit this church, and you know that you, rem you rem remember the experience of walking inside, and uh, some people cannot help but break into tears. And uh, seeing there the seat of Peter, this is the um, seat of the first pope. Um, the reason why they constructed St. Peter's Basilica there is because way under the confessional, that is where they found the bones of our first pope. And uh, if you get to visit one day, you will go to the confessional, the front of the al altar, and recite the creed. And if you recite it um, with that realization that here is where the church, <laughs> the first pope, um, is buried. Sometimes you cannot control yourself and you just have to kneel. And... Uh, our experience with beauty through art, then the goodness of God is revealed to us. And we can be brought into an even, even greater awareness of his goodness. And um, it's designed in such a way that, you know, even externally, you have there like the church with the two arms reaching out to the world. It's like that, um, reaching out to the world. And the brilliance of the Bernini called the columns of Bernini. You have there four uh, layers, no, or even five layers of columns. But there is a mark here where if you stand, you're going to just see one layer. <laughs> Perfect symmetry. The, um, that's our treasure. That's our um, mother, the church, the mother of all churches, we call it. That's why, in fact, you normally cannot build a bigger church than St. Peter's out of deference to this uh, mother of all churches. They, they actually built a bigger church in uh, Valle de los Caidos in Spain, in Madrid, in honor of those who died during the Spanish Civil War. It turned out to be bigger than St. Peter's. And so out of deference, they cut it. They only made the church as the center. The remaining aisles the, were just corridors. <laughs> But again, you go and you see, this is my church, the birthplace of the papacy. This is what I am most proud of. We make them see the beauty of uh, the arts of our faith to do the years or to do the centuries rather, and we make them realize, oh, this is um, what it means to be a Catholic. Um, giving, offering to God what is really worthy of being offered to God. Yes, it, there, it looks like a key, no? because you remember, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, giving him the keys of heaven, and the gates of hell shall not prevail, it, um, prevail against it. 
but um, with that symbol of uh, the church embracing the world in a welcoming um, fashion. That's why that stretch of street facing there is called the Via Conciliazione. <laughs> so you reconcile with God, come to God, come and be, um, be in the presence of the sublime with his beauty. So that's how powerful art can be. It can even bring about conversion. And I, I know uh, many people who uh, maybe not even believing in God, maybe uh, have left the Catholic Church, and then they get the chance to visit um, something like St. Peter's Basilica. They enter and they undergo a conversion through the, uh, through the eyes, through what they see. Because faith can pass through the senses, through the eyes, through what we hear. The grandeur of the divine. And as I said, you cannot but exclaim, God is here. That is how our uh, beautiful art should be able to lead people to the discovery of God. Well, you know, uh, Sir Burns talked about it in his conversion story. When he was a Protestant, he even asked <laughs> his mom to destroy the images of Our Lady. But uh, no, in order to be effective in its pastoral role, a religious art had to be clear, persuasive, and powerful because it's one way of instructing. Now, we have to make it very clear we don't worship the images, the anitos, the um, some people, for example, criticize the devotees of uh, Poong Nazareno, the Black Nazarene in Quiapo. Uh, no, they're not worshiping it. They're not idolizing it. They're, it's not idolatry. They're, that's the only faith they have. The, for many of them, they go there because that's the last hope they have. They don't want to let go of that love for our Lord in the, of the Black Nazareth, uh, uh, that image the, um, that is very powerful, and very uh, miraculous also. But at the same time, it's like a reminder for them that God is here. And hang on. Uh, you may, people may have given up on you, but Christ remains to be there for you. So that's not idolatry. We do not idolize these images. They are representation of our faith, of our God being there. And so it's very important that we, in fact, catechize people about this. Uh, because sometimes lack of doctrine may also lead them into looking like they are uh, they're idolizing. You know the Filipino habit of uh, punas punas, <laughs> wiping the image. And then I sometimes see people in churches they hold to the image and then they touch their uh, different parts of the body. You know, like as if, um, uh, no, um, sometimes we also need to educate these um, people that uh, <laughs> they don't need to touch. They don't need to do that. God is powerful enough to know, to read our hearts. And he is going to give us the grace that we need. He listens to us even if we are not touching the image <laughs> so then um, of course you are very familiar with the Sistine Chapel the last judgment the final judgment um, altar that uh, Michelangelo painted I showed this also to you the other day and some people didn't like it when they restored it when they cleaned it Japanese spent millions of dollars and many years in removing not paint, repainting but removing uh, sand, soil, dust, um, uh, suits that mm, stuck there for the last 400 years. And some people uh, didn't like it because it looked so modern, so bright. Well, that's how Michelangelo was far ahead of his time. He was using pastel colors even before it became a fad in the modern times. <laughs> or we look at this image of Our Lady, the Pieta of Michelangelo and it's Carrara marble, the hardest uh, of marbles. And yet we look at it with a flowing, silky dress and, and beautiful. 
and the in the face of our lady that really bespeaks of womanhood the beauty of womanhood of our lady so then it's a very powerful way of being able to transmit to our students to the younger generations the, um, the beauty of our faith it's in th it has always been integral to religion the arts and traditional cultures transmit the central beliefs and values of those cultures and those beliefs and values have a strong religious or spiritual dimension all forms of protestantism show a degree of hostility to religious images especially sculpture and large paintings that's why during the protestant revolt there were many artworks beautiful art pieces that were destroyed or even churches that um, were destroyed but we uh, because they considered them as um, idol worship as i mentioned we have to educate the young people that wait this is not idolatry this is a way of being able to get them to understand the faith to appreciate better this is what jesus did for me he died for me on the cross and this is how united Mary was. She was practically crucified with our Lord because her own soul, a sword, had pierced. So um, we teach the beauty of um, the Passion of Christ. Thankfully, we also now have some movies that are effective and powerful. The Chosen series, if you have not explored it yet, they're fantastically made. And uh, they were made with um, um, mind, I mean, thinking of this new generation of young people. And there are now many materials that you can use, for example, side by side with a chosen series. Yeah, you can download the app and it's free. That's the beautiful thing about it. And um, um, a very good way for the young people especially to get to know jesus better so uh, all these beautiful paintings of um, the past of the artists that made them saint john paul ii has this to say authentic christian art is that which through sensible perception by seeing by hearing in the case of music gives the intuition that the lord is present in his church that the events of salvation history give meaning and orientation to our life, that the glory that is promised us already transforms our existence. Sacred art must tend to offer us a visual synthesis of all dimensions of our faith. That's a beautiful quotation from St. John Paul II. Okay, now I'm going to teach you a bit of Visio Divina. Of course, we know the Lectio Divina using the bible as a way of uh, being able to get the young people i mean anyone to get to know our lord better this time there is another method called the visio divina making use of artwork or painting so you show a picture a painting an artwork um, pray in quiet with your eyes closed bring yourself towards stillness get them to first put themselves in the proper presence of god <clears throat> in the proper disposition to hear, not just to say, as I mentioned earlier, well, that's what it means to contemplate. And then gaze, sorry, uh, gaze at the image. Let your eyes rest on the characters and objects. Note your feelings as you examine the whole and parts of the work. This example of painting of San Rafael Sanzio, the, the transfiguration. St. Maria Escriva recommends this is the best way to um, do prayer. You read something from the Bible and then put yourself as one more character. For example, transfiguration of our Lord. Try to imagine yourself being there in the scene, watching Peter, James, and John because they were the only three apostles that Jesus brought with him in the transfiguration. And then suddenly they saw Moses and imagine yourself being, um, the, how do you call that? Somebody just in the, um, happened to be passing by. <laughs> and then you imagine, for example, the um, 
how Jesus was transfigured and um, um, Peter, James, and John saw him as God, not as man, but as God. We are told by theologians that this was Jesus' way of preparing, especially these three, the sons of thunder, uh, preparing them for the miracle of the Eucharist. That um, when they, one day, will have to do this in memory of me, do the Eucharistic um, um, sacrifice. When they renew it, because Jesus commanded them, do this in memory of me. They know that they are not just holding a piece of bread. They will be holding God himself that they have seen. Um, yes, but they didn't going Zoom background during class. And then beautiful picture you watch you put yourself as one more character that you are there at the foot of the cross you try to console the blessed virgin mary um, and john you see him john was the only apostle and he must have been 15 years old can you imagine he must have been 12 years old when he decided to follow jesus as an apostle three years later he was the only one there he's the only apostle not married you see what purity can do that's what made him stay on uh, beside Jesus on the cross while the others fled, ran away. Read or listen to accounts of the events. We read the gospel part of it. They might be scripture, insights into the work, guided meditation. How loving Mother Mary stood by the cross. She was there, strong, very um, woman, but very powerful uh, will strong will she didn't she was not afraid of the roman soldiers capturing her that is our lady but seeing her son suffering there on the cross for three hours we are told from the time he was crucified and the time that he was hanging there on the cross it took three hours before finally jesus breathed this last and our lady was there Effectively, it's like she herself was like crucified with her son, feeling the pain of her son. Imagine that you are in the scene, scene. What do you see from your vantage point? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you sense? We look at this image of uh, the birth of our Lord, the adoration of the shepherds, and we can smell the shepherds. We are side by side with them, simple people. When God was born, he chose to first appear to these shepherds. Before the three kings, the three wise men found Jesus, first it was simple, ordinary people. And we thank our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be with you at this moment of your birth. And we see St. Joseph there, maybe uh, even attending to us even while mary and joseph were busy making sure that the kid the baby child the child jesus is uh, um, okay <laughs> comfortable joseph must even have asked the shepherds uh, have you eaten are you hungry um are you okay <laughs> they came uh, because they were the very first ones to hear the good news and we put ourselves there as one more shepherd. We feel like them, simple people. How is the sacred present to you in this experience? We look at this picture painted by Greco of the tears of St. Peter. Remember why he shed tears? Because he realized he betrayed our Lord. Three times he denied him. Even if he was violently objecting, objecting to Jesus, no way will I deny you. And Jesus told him three times, you're going to deny me. And he realized it. And he broke into tears. Of course, Judas also realized he betrayed Jesus. And so what did he do? He hanged himself, threw away the 30 silver coins. But Peter, on the other hand, repented. And then we apply it to our life, we too have to realize the many times we denied our Lord. We too have to realize the many times we were not um, faithful enough. Like Peter, who was given the keys, uh, who was given the, the 
privilege of being the first pope, the first successor of Jesus on earth, and yet he was weak enough uh, not to stand by our Lord, and he denied him. And not only that, he wasn't there during the crucifixion, but he realized it. And then we come to realize no matter how bad we may have become, <laughs> repentance, we can always go back. We can always have that sorrow of love and then make resolutions like Peter. And from being a fisherman, an apostle, denying our Lord, leaving him, but went back and then went on to become our first pope and did that work all the way to his death because he was crucified upside down. In fact, when he was said, you're going to be crucified, uh, Peter said, oh, how beautiful it is to die in the same way as my master. And so uh, Herod said, no, upside down, <laughs> not like your master. How, this, uh, how does this video, Visio Divina, relate to our life now? And then, So um, this is one way of teaching the young people through uh, beautiful artwork. Um, I have been showing different pictures along the way. But the idea of the Visio uh, Divina is just use one and then uh, we follow those steps. No? Uh, by the way, the slides are already downloadable in Facebook. It has been posted at 4.20 p.m. And so you can already download it together with all those beautiful artworks that I also showed them, uh, showed there, as well as this step-by-step -step guide that you can follow to do the Visio Divina. We make resolutions. This visio divina, the repentance of Peter, the tears of Peter, we come up with the resolutions love, of love. Lord, no more, no more denying you. I deny you whenever I fall into sin. I deny you whenever I choose sin over good. When I don't go to Mass and miss Mass uh, for flimsy reasons, it's like denying you like Peter, but like Peter. I'm repentant and I want to start again, I, I begin again. Sanctity, Saint Jose Maria Escriva said, is beginning, consists in beginning and beginning again. This painting by Dali, which is one of the most um, intriguing pictures of the crucifixion, he, he made sure that the body of our Lord here is not typically, you know, blooded with all the scourging marks and all that. And it's like, the view of God the Father. <laughs> you know, um, Mel Gibson tried to do it in the, um, the movie, The Passion of the Christ, especially with that final uh, fall, the tear of God falling into the ground. <laughs> but before that, the vision of um, the crucifixion from the top, it's like God looking down, behold my son that you have killed. <laughs> that he gave himself for all of you. Now, very beautiful painting of uh, the descent from the cross by Van der Weyden. It can lead a person to conversion just to look at the suffering of Our Lady that is parallel to the suffering that Jesus had to uh, go through because her own soul, a sword, had pierced. Um, sometimes we even see the paintings of Our Lady with the seven swords pier piercing her heart you know, with the seven sorrows. Um, but Our Lord there, um, being carried, uh, being brought down from the cross, and to think that all these He did for love of us, for love of you, because of our sins, your sins and mine. I mean, if not for the sin of man, there would have been no need for the crucifixion. After all, God being powerful, all-powerful, omnipotent, could have, for example, simply flicked his finger, quote-unquote, didn't have a finger, his pure spirit, in order to save us. But no, he chose to do it in the most loving way visible for us, sending down his son and his son dying in the most ignominious of death, being counted among criminals. And then finally, what insight from this experience do you want to retain? How will you do that? So these are all part of um, Visio Divina that we can do in order to um, make use of art to make students 
reflect, make the solutions, and then after realizing many things, thanking God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the beauty of art. Thank you for the love that you have for me, that for the sublime beauty that you have, that I have experienced from this beautiful art. One of the most beautiful paintings ever. Unfortunately, Leonardo da Vinci painted it on a wall, no? <laughs> um, on top of the refectory wall. This is, in fact, a wall, the, the um, uh, Last Supper. And he captures here the moment when, as soon as Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And then a picture. <laughs> so uh, every character here um, shows how later on he is going to uh, fulfill his being an apostle. John, of course, right beside our Lord, the one who put his head on the breast of our Lord. So he definitely has got to be right beside there uh, with somebody beside him telling, can you ask, can you ask who it is that will betray? <laughs> Asking John to ask Jesus because they know that John was the one that was closest, the beloved uh, disciple. No? Um, so amazing, beautiful painting like this with a double perspective. That's one of the ways that, uh, you know, the perspective is a unique style used by Leonardo da Vinci. In the case of The Last Supper, there's not just one, but actually two, similar to what he did uh, with the painting of Mona Lisa. That's the reason why <clears throat> that's the reason why it's considered to be uh, like a, I don't know um, enigmatic smile they call it. Of course, this became very popular thanks to the year of mercy that we had, and then the return of the prodigal son uh, when the painter captured that very moment when the son came back. But that's not the highlight. The father accepting back the son you know that jesus invented the <laughs> parable of the prodigal son i won't be surprised if joseph may have taught him that parable but it's one of the most i have phd in literature and i tell you as a literary literary <laughs> um, literature teacher the parable of the prodigal son is one of the best literary pieces ever concocted by the human creative mind the son uh, could not wait for the father to die. So he goes to the dad and says, Dad, I cannot wait for you to die. Can you just give me my inheritance? I wish you're dead, but never mind about the wishing. Give me my inheritance. I cannot wait for you to die. <laughs> That's one of the worst sins you can ever commit against a parent. And the father being a loving father gave the inheritance to the son. And you know what he did? He went to the fireplace um, squandered there in wine, women, and song <laughs> until he ran, he finished up all his inheritance to the point that, uh, and then there was famine in the place, and he had to look for work, and the only work he could find is feeding the pigs, the swine. And the famine was so bad, he was eating the food that he was supposed to feed the pigs. And then he realized. In my father's house, even the servants had good food. Ah, I know what I'll do. This is how evil the son is. The son said, I know what I'll do. I am going to go back to my father. And I'm going to say this. Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth. He prepared a speech. Was he sorry? No, he was not sorry. He was just after a good food. I mean, he was just after the good life. <laughs> That's how bad the son is. But he goes back anyway with a prepared speech. And the loving father has been sitting by the window waiting for the return of the son. And when he saw the son coming from afar, he did not wait. He ran in order to welcome him, in order to embrace him. And the son was going to deliver the prepared speech. Father, I have sinned against... No, he, told, he did not allow him to finish the prepared speech. He embraced him, gave the cloak around him, gave the ring on his finger, and then told the servants, kill the fattened calf because my son, who was lost, has come back to life. 
And then we make the young people realize we too are like the prodigal son. No matter how bad our sin is, no matter how far away we may have come, gone, no matter how serious your, your sin may be, pornography, abortion, um, the Father has been waiting for you. That's the beauty of confession, that it is good. The Father, the priest there, uh, representing God, representing Christ, is going to forgive you no matter how big your sin is. Come back. Our loving Father has been sitting by the window side waiting for us. This is the power of art and the beauty of using um, visuals to be able to drive home the point, the beauty of literature, poetry, of the storytelling, the parables that Jesus prepared, that Jesus gave. Beauty can bring people to their senses, make them see what is true and good. And so, um, you know, the first painting of Our Lady, they say, was done by St. Luke. St. <laughs> Luke. Uh, well, it's a legend. We don't have clear proofs of it, but they say this is one of those three paintings Luke must have made of Jesus, the two apostles, two apostles there, and then the Blessed Lady on the right side. <clears throat> so that's why you sometimes see paintings of St. Luke painting the Virgin Mary. He must have been the first one. Beauty has a powerful evangelizing effect, and especially today, Beauty should be a starting point for evangelization. Why? Because these things of arguing, uh, logical demonstrations, reasoning, in the, in the, during this time of fake news, it, it doesn't work as well. So we move the heart, we move the mind, we move the body, I mean the um, soul of the young people. Well, this is the last painting I will show you of the entombment of Christ by Caravaggio. Um, of showing our Lord being brought down from the cross, being carried by these men. And then the tomb here looks like an altar, the altar of the sacrifice. And then we have a woman there. In we see Our Lady uh, presented as an older um, person who is... Again, the unity of our Lord and our Lady in the sacrifice of the cross. And that cross will be continued on in the sacrifice, sacrifice of the altar, making you realize that it's the same Christ that is offered there in the altar. So, well, uh, that is a beautiful painting. And that's one example of how art can be used to move the hearts of young people, of our students. Beauty will save the world, St. John Paul II said, because this beauty is Christ, the only beauty that defies evil and triumphs over death. By love, the most beautiful of the children of men became the man of sorrows, without beauty, without majesty, no looks to attract our eyes. And so he rendered to man, to each and every man, the fullness of his beauty, his dignity, and his grandeur. And it's 5.15. Fortunately, we have run out of time. The PowerPoint is downloadable in Facebook. And we invite you to um, continue um, sharing, discussing, bringing up um, questions in the Facebook page. And you have all the members of the group there who can possibly uh, reply, respond, give their ideas. Okay, well, again, we thank you very much for joining us in this um, series. I would like to invite Burns also to uh, say a bit of uh, his goodbye. After, I uh, let me see, can I just uh, invite you to please turn on your video so that we can do the final <laughs> uh, pictorials. Let me see. Huh? I just want to give you opportunity to unmute yourself okay so then um let's uh, see uh am i sharing screen uh, i'll just uh, turn off first the recording <clears throat>